Welcome to the common tern nesting islands on Lake Champlain. The common tern is a state endangered seabird that has a long history of nesting on the lake. The population reached its largest size in the 1960s when there were 300 to 400 pairs nesting here each year. By the 1980s, the population was down to less than 50 pairs, mostly because of human disturbance and predation. In the 80s, the Vermont Institute of Natural Science stepped in to monitor and manage the islands, creating what is now the Vermont Common Tern Recovery Project, run by biologists from Audubon, Vermont. Since this conservation project began, tern numbers have slowly increased to about 200 pairs. Terns typically lay two to three eggs in mid-May to mid-June, and chicks begin to hatch about three weeks later. The chicks hatch asynchronously, and the first chick to hatch usually has the greatest chance for survival. But in years with plenty of food, the parents can raise all three. The chicks start to move around after two to three days, using this cryptic coloration to hide among the rocks and vegetation. After a week to ten days, the chicks start to lose that camouflage, and by fledging age, about two to three weeks later, most of the fluffy down is replaced with waterproof adult plumage. At the end of the season, the young fledglings follow their parents to Central and South America for the winter, where they usually stay for a whole year before flying back up to the islands to raise their own young. Common terns have traditionally nested on six small islands north of the Sandbar Causeway in what is known as the Inland Sea. Now they only nest on three of the islands, Papa Squash Island, off of Swanton, and Rock Island in St. Albans Bay. Only in the last two years have birds returned to the third, called Grandma's Island, off of Butler Island in Grand Isle County. The success of the colonies since the 80s has been largely thanks to conservation work by project biologists. On a typical day, the first thing researchers do is to get a count of all the birds on and around the islands. Other species like gulls, cormorants, ducks, and sandpipers are also counted for additional information. When we approach the island, the birds take off and fly in circles overhead. This behavior, called dreading, is the normal response to threats and disturbance. The birds won't land until we leave, so it's important to keep our time on the island to a minimum, usually about half an hour. When we arrive, we patrol the island looking for nests, eggs, and chicks. When we find the nest, we record its location and contents and put a numbered marker next to it. This allows us to follow the nest throughout the season and keep track of its contents. Because our time on the islands is so limited, we record as much data as possible while we're there. In addition to nest and chick information, we record things like the weather, time, observations about the tern's behavior that day, and what we accomplish while on the island. Keeping thorough notes and complete data sheets is critical to successful field work. If we find a chick, we record its age and put a steel band on its leg. On the band is a unique number that lets us re-identify the bird and keep track of its progress while it's on the island. Bird banding is also an important tool for understanding migration routes and population dynamics. This year, a bird that hatched on Papa Squash Island in 1994 was recaptured at a colony on the St. Lawrence River. This technique has shown us that the Lake Champlain terns are part of a larger inland metapopulation that includes colonies on the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes. Isolated populations are usually more vulnerable, so it's important to look for evidence connecting Lake Champlain to other colonies. Another part of the conservation plan is to make and deploy these plywood chick shelters. The shelters are placed about six inches away from the nests just before the chicks hatch. The shelters shade the eggs and new hatches and provide older chicks with a place to escape the weather in this otherwise exposed environment, and they may also be used as a place to hide from predators. Public education is an important piece to any conservation effort. Reducing human disturbance around the island really relies on the support of the community. We put signs and buoys around the island to let people know that it's a sensitive place. We also try to include Vermonters in the conservation process. In 2007, students at the Brewster Pierce Memorial School and the North Hero Elementary School painted nearly 60 turn decoys for use on Grandma's Island. Later in the season, we invited the students for a boat ride out to the islands to see their hard work in action. Connections like this between the public and the natural world go a long way in conservation, especially on Lake Champlain. The decoys that the students painted were used as part of a social attraction system to draw turns to Grandma's Island. A solar-powered sound system was constructed on the island to broadcast turn sounds, and the decoys made the island look like a healthy turn colony. Social attraction is used in many conservation projects for a wide range of colonial species. The system that we used on Grandma's Island was a design used in the 70s to attract puffins to nesting islands in Maine. Our system drew five breeding pairs to the island, producing the first chick to fledge from there in almost 35 years. Another recent addition to the management plans are these white wires strung up over the island. 
One of the largest problems on our island is overcrowding of nesting space by cormorants and gulls. Too much gull activity pushes terns to the perimeter of the islands, leaving very little room for colony growth. By stringing up these wires, non-predatory species like gulls and cormorants are deterred from landing on the island, and instead roost only on the ledges and outskirts. Since this wired grid system was installed, terns have started nesting in new areas on the islands. This year we modified this grid system and installed fencing to try to keep out predators, using video surveillance to see how well it worked. Conservation biology is an applied science that combines scientific research with hands-on management. In the next section, we'll focus on the surveillance system. We'll go through some of this season's footage highlights and see how to use clues from natural science to help us better conserve this species. This is the north tip of Papasquash Island in early June at 8.40 p.m., and this is what footage captured from our surveillance system looks like. The camera is recorded from just before dusk to about 3 in the morning in hopes of capturing footage that will help researchers develop more effective conservation strategies. You can see that chick shelters have been deployed, and preliminary grid wires have been set up to keep gulls and cormorants off of prime nesting areas. As the season progresses, more of this grid wire will be strung up, creating a tight web of overhead wires that may prevent some predators, like great horned owls and black-crowned night herons, from accessing nests from the air. This is a good example of what a typical common tern colony looks like. Nests are spaced 1 to 2 meters apart and are constructed on bare rock or open ground using nearby materials to build a nest cup. The colony looks pretty calm tonight. Increased disturbance from people or predators usually makes the colony flighty and unsettled. This is a good sign. It shows that birds are either handling disturbance well, or there hasn't been a lot of it recently. The sun is setting and turn activity is beginning to quiet down for the night. About this time, one parent usually settles to incubate the nest for the night, and the other parent leaves the island or roosts on the rocky edge, but we'll later see that this isn't always the case. By about 9.30pm, most of the birds that are still incubating will remain there for the rest of the night, and turns that have left the nest will probably not return until dawn. Nocturnal desertion is when both parents leave the nest for the night. The parents usually desert between 9.15 and 9.45 and return to the nest the following morning. This behavior is very common in colonies with frequent predation. Biologically speaking, an organism's goal is to replicate itself before it dies. Terns are long-lived birds, some surviving over 20 years, so there's not much pressure for a bird to raise offspring every season. If predators are visiting the colony, it makes more sense for a bird to leave the nest and ensure its own survival, rather than risk its life to raise chicks in a dangerous environment. Turn colonies experienced increased nocturnal desertion one to two weeks after a predation event, even if that predator doesn't return to the island. On our islands, birds seem to desert the nest more often than not, especially after predators have been active. This is usually not too concerning because eggs typically hatch even with recurring desertion. In some cases, repeated desertion from predation can cause permanent abandonment or a full colony collapse. Some individuals consistently incubate the nest all night, this may indicate that predation is at a lull or that some individuals are just more tenacious than others. Desertion footage like this can be a clue that nocturnal predators have recently been visiting the island. In an effort to reduce predation, the Vermont Common Turn Recovery Project installed several experimental exclosures and used video surveillance to test their effectiveness against predators and their impact on turns daily life. It sounds like a simple design erect fencing around nests, and string wires over top the enclosed area. But how high should we make the fence? How narrow should the gaps in the wires be? Should there be a small gap underneath the fence? How many nests should we place it around? And when should it be installed? These are all questions that had to be answered in the course of the season. The first exclosures were made with fencing one and a half feet tall and with three to five foot gaps between overhead grid wires. They were set up around five to ten nests, enclosing an area about the size of a small bedroom. Turns didn't appear to have any trouble landing and taking off through these exclosures, but would they keep a predator out?